Well, hello all. Uh, by way of introduction, I uh, should begin uh, saying that uh, I have received more compliments uh, from students and colleagues uh, for organizing this conference, which I did not organize, uh, <laughs> than for many conferences which I actually did organize. Uh, the conference is uh, first and foremost uh, Prasenjit Duara's doing, uh, whom I would like to thank for putting all of this uh, uh, impressive program together. Thank you. Uh, and also Jake. Uh, and, uh, Jake Then, of course, uh, Jake Werner actually makes it, hap uh, <laughs> makes it happen. So if you have any questions uh, uh, as to the logistics, he is the person to ask. Uh, now, when uh, Presenjit looked around for a maitre d' uh, to speed along the proceedings, uh, he looked at someone who would look the part and could keep time. And Empire, writing back, uh, thought there must be a German in the department. No. <laughs> uh, and so it is that he discovered me. Uh, I'm Michael Geyer, the German and European historian who also occasionally dabbles in uh, global history. So, welcome all uh, to this conference on history textbooks and pro the profession. Uh, as in keeping with my role as maitre d', I'm told to tell you that uh, the ladies' room is on the fourth floor and the men's room is on the third. Uh, lunch will be, will be served for panelists and discussions, coffee and refreshments are for all. Uh, I should remind panelists and the audience uh, that we have a full program. Therefore, uh, panelists have a maximum of 25 to 30 minutes for, your, uh, for their presentations, and discussions have uh, 20 minutes. And let me add, if you do not adhere to the rules, you will discover why he chose the German. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I should mention, the only thing I said was, Michael, you're so <laughs> magisterial. <laughs> <laughs> you do a good job. See? <laughs> <laughs> the empire writes back. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a way of introducing the event, uh, I might say that uh, uh, for someone like Hugo Crotius, uh, the shifty Dutch lawyer and culture hero of natural and human rights uh, as a prerequisite for peace, this kind of discussion we are having today uh, would have been unimaginable, and indeed he would have considered it highly counterproductive, for he thought that the only way to ascertain peace in an age of deep civic and religious divisions was to make sure that the defeated remained silent, the victims were ostracized, and the victors wrote history. Everything else, and that's not a dumb idea, I should say, everything <laughs> else would crack the thin veneer of order, would create civil disorder, and would generate new civil war. Obviously, school book controversies and their resolution point to a very different situation and to very different kinds of strategies in ascertaining order, and for that matter, in ascertaining peace. <clears throat> what these strategies are, what this situation is, I think, and I hope we will find out uh, today. In this context, we will certainly wonder, uh, in the subaltern mode, as it were, who speaks in these textbook controversies. We will no doubt want to reflect on how and why it is that history should move into the role of a mediator and accommodator of clashing views and clashing subject positions, when for most of the time, history rather did the work Grotius considered essential for peace. It wrote the words of the victor. <coughs> Whatever conclusion we come to in this matter, the very pervasiveness of history and school book controversies must strike us very vividly. 
first rebuke I got for this conference, I did, uh, uh, which I did not organize, uh, is that I did uh, is that someone told me that I did not pay sufficient attention to the French. <laughs> and indeed, uh, they do have their school book controversies worth detailing. But then it dawned on me, just in the purview of my own little part of the world, uh, looking at the program that somehow I missed the Estonians, which happened to be in New York Times the day before yesterday, and their conflicts with the Russians as well. And round and round it goes. <clears throat> so I can certainly say that we are at the moment uh, of a deep and pervasive unsettlement of history, of history writing, and of history education. And this unsettlement is indeed global. The past, it seems, is being recoded everywhere, and this is a very long way away from the days when, in our foolish pride as young Germans in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we thought we were called upon to carry the burden of all the world's injustices on our shoulders. So by now, very clearly, this is a global event. Unsettled history, unsettled memory, this is one of the conditions, and I would say it is a defining condition of our global age. This said, there are just two very brief things I wanted to say about this condition, because in a way I hope for a better understanding of both at the end of our one-day conference. <coughs> First, while the globality of school book controversies is noteworthy in and of itself, it is really the entangled nature of history and memory that has emerged as the major chance, but also as the major conundrum, and not just as we now discover for Japan. What we discover quite systematically everywhere is that your own <coughs> history is always all is always also somebody else's history. And in some cases, and those cases are highly illuminating and worth questioning, everybody else's history. That your own history is, of course, always also a composite history that silences and effaces uh, those who are not in the charm circle of the week. What we would want to know, then, is how and why this simple fact that we have an entangled history has been so effectively unlearned and what it takes to relearn it. Can we truly come around to write an entangled history, say, of Germany, which would have put right into the middle of the Ukraine, for example, but certainly would also kind of bring us all the way to New Zealand uh, due to the emigre populations there, and some very famous emigres ended up in New Zealand. Uh, or would, it, would we simply have to settle with kind of damage control, for example, in the, matter of, uh, in the manner of the diplomacy of German-French or German-Polish textbook agreements? Very important stuff, certainly important for what is happening now in East Asia, but uh, it is damage control. So the question is, can we write this entangled history, and, what, and can we write this entangled textbook history? Second, we need to be concerned with the textbook as a weapon of mass instruction, as Charles Ingrao <laughs> formulated uh, uh, it so well. Uh, but I was equally intrigued and shocked uh, by one of the recent uh, editions of uh, Mark Seldon's uh, Japan Focus, uh, which carried the story about, uh, I quote, Japan's history wars and popular consciousness, and highlighted the role of comic books in shaping popular memory and a recollection of history. And it is a highly racist one at that. In Germany, we discover that uh, students are taught correct, entangled history, but we also realize, I've come to realize, that they feel their history quite differently. They feel, at this point, it seems, oppressed and victimized by the Nazis, and that's the harmless vision. 
<laughs> In any case, what this all points to is the need for a critical reflection <coughs> on the medium or the media of history, and for that matter of collective memory. Uh, textbooks are a peculiar genre of a mass age, a Fordist concoction, as some of my friends would say, in the same league as mass production, mass consumption, and mass destruction. But this is clearly no longer the case. And this is clearly no longer quite our world today. What is clear is that the medium matters, but what the medium or the media of memory and history are, and whether they are the same or whether they are different, that's no longer quite that certain. <clears throat> Then again, this is why we set out to compare national controversies over textbooks in the global age and why we have this conference in the first place. And with this, I would like to introduce our first uh, speakers. Uh, uh, Yoshiko Nosaki <coughs> received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin in Madison in educational policy studies. She is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy at State University of New York, Buffalo. Her research and teaching interests focuses on comparative international studies of gender and women's <coughs> education, nationalism and curriculum textbook controversies, educational reform, peace education, and education and politics in Asian countries. Among her recent publications, let me just mention War Memory, Nationalism and Education in Post-War Japan, uh, Japan uh, and Struggles over Difference, Curriculum, Texts and Pedagogy. Mark Selden uh, received his PhD uh, in History from Yale University in 1967. He is a senior fellow in the East Asia program at Cornell University and is coordinator of Japan Focus, uh, the electronic journal and archive on Japan and Asia, on the Asia Pacific. His research centers on modern and contemporary China, Japan and Asia, war and peace, <coughs> political economy of development and historical memory. His recent publications, or his most recent publications include, well, not really, his publications include the famous revolu Revolution and Resistance and Reform in Village China, uh, War and State Terrorism, the United States, Japan, and the Asia Pacific in the long 20th century, and I could go on and on and on. Uh, perhaps I should mention Censoring History, Citizenship and Memory in Japan, Germany and the United States. He did in one book what we are doing in the conference today. Then uh, uh, Niladri Bhattacharya is professor of modern history at the Center for Historical Studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He held visiting positions at the University of Wit Witwatersrand and the Ecole des Hautes de Sciences Sociales. He edited the volume on commercialization of Indian agriculture, a topic very dear to my heart, uh, and is preparing a major study on the great agrarian conquest, but has also worked on customs and customary law in colonial India, as well as transhumans and long distance trade. Above all, in, in our context, he is chief <coughs> advisor of the school history textbooks being prepared by the National Council for Education Research in, uh, in, in India. Now, I think I got a little confused. I introduced, yeah, well, where are we now? No, I'm not confused. Here we go. Just think I am. Because there are so many names here to be set up for the first session. Charles Ingrao uh, here received his PhD from Brown University in 1974. He is currently professor of history at Purdue University. Since 1995, he has been the editor of the Austrian History Yearbook, and since 1997, general editor of the Purdue University Press Central European Studies Series. 
His area specialty is early modern Europe, Habsburg, and Central European history. His publications include The Germans and the East, uh, edited with Franz Schabo, The Habsburg Monarchy, 1816-1815, and indeed I could go on and on. Um, but we'll leave it at that and simply say that the discussion will be presented to uh, discussion will be presented to Ara, but I will not introduce <coughs> him because he is famous enough in his own right. <laughs> uh, we will begin uh, this section on politics with a paper. Uh, uh, on historical memory or a presentation on historical memory, international <laughs> conflict and Japanese textbook controversies in three epochs. Uh, Yoshiko and uh, Mark will uh, present. Thank you very much. Uh, let the uh, magisterial chair note that our time, our 25 to 30 minutes begins at uh, yes. 10 of, <laughs> yes. says 10 of 5, but uh, anyway, um, it begins now. Uh, I get a minute at the beginning. Yoshiko uh, lays out the essence of the paper, and I get to uh, comment in the in the final part. Uh, I want simply want to note uh, that um, our wily leader has chosen to position um, this conference on on May fourth, uh, which is the uh, quintessential day of Chinese nationalism. Uh, and one might say of Chinese revolution, uh, the moment uh, when uh, Chinese students rose up uh, against, uh, against Japan uh, uh, in terms of the outcome of World War I. And I simply want to set our paper, and indeed perhaps the pa papers uh, overall, uh, in the context uh, of nationalism. Uh, Michael Geyer uh, has, has noted uh, uh, Grotius' wisdom uh, uh, about uh, Victor's writing history, whether this is desirable or not, uh, this has always uh, been the case. Uh, but an interesting question emerges as to who the victors are uh, at a certain point. For example, the United States could write the history of Japan at the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal and then uh, during the occupation. Uh, but of course, uh, the Japanese uh, have been writing their own history subsequently, and the question of whether that should be an entangled history uh, or a history uh, of, of Japan is certainly central to what we're talking about. I simply want to make uh, first the obvious point uh, that the reason we're here, in fact, uh, is all about nationalism. This is why textbooks have moved from the gray area of something not to be noticed uh, to happen in classrooms so dull that we don't even remember that we ever studied them uh, to the front pages. Uh, and maybe we get to go first with Japan because its controversy seems to boil over into angry politics uh, so that the issues even emerge when a Japanese prime minister visits the United States uh, last, last week. Um, but the issues, uh, as I'm suggesting, in fact, uh, are all about nationalism and the alternatives to nationalism, uh, which relate, I think, to uh, Geyer's point about entangled history. Uh, well, it's one thing to note the entanglement, but how to unentangle in ways that produce cooperative outcomes rather than uh, produce further textbook wars, further manga wars, further nationalism wars. I think that's really what the stakes are here. Well, um, I'm sitting here to provide certain specifics for the Japanese textbook controversy in the past uh, 60 years. Um, uh, basically, in the paper, I talked about three epochs. Uh, the, in, in Japanese uh, post-war history, there are three uh, epochs in which uh, textbook uh, specifically became a target of political uh, uh, Reorganization, political uh, uh, consolidation, and it was uh, 1955 and 1979 and 1995. Uh, each epoch, you know, did have a, you know different lengths of the controversy period. Actually, uh, the one, the last one started 1995. Actually, continues today, so it's almost. Uh, 
uh, <coughs> 12 years. Um, but uh, I talk about a little bit about you know the three epochs you know uh, in in order. Uh, 1955 is Japan is actually uh, emerged from the occupation. The San Francisco Peace Treaty was concluded in 1952, and uh, you know following that uh, there are some uh, divisions within the conservative bloc as well as within the uh, uh, so-called progressive, we call the Kakushin politics, left-wing politics. And actually, uh, both uh, conservative bloc, nationalist bloc are uh, divided, and also uh, socialist party are also divided uh, because of the issue of peace treaty, uh, which is basically one-sided to peace treaty. So uh, right-wing uh, supported it, but left-wing socialist party didn't support it, so they split. Uh, this kind of you know, really, really uh, complex uh, uh, situation uh, uh, people uh, uh, sort of you know, didn't uh, really realize you know, what's going to happen next. But you know, uh, first, a socialist party decided to be reunited for many different reasons. Uh, there, are, there are ideological differences are there, but basically they, they decided to, to be reunited is more advantageous. And then uh, there are um, uh, so then uh, divided uh, national uh, right wing and uh, conservative bloc also <coughs> had a lot of pressure from a business circle, some other people to be reunited. So uh, actually, uh, in the, um, in the uh, election, um, uh, both. Uh, Conservative blocs and uh, um, uh, socialist party fractions won pretty well. So then, um, that, that in that election, a uh, textbook issue became a uh, sort of uh, also uh, when uh, Japanese uh, controversy happens. And also, uh, the textbook is often started with a sideline story. The main issue is always a revision of the constitution, uh, which is uh, 1964. Uh, 1946 uh, constitution, uh, which is uh, written in under occupation. So always conservative, uh, some segments of conservative uh, block want to revise it. So um, in the election, um, basically, uh, the, because uh, socialist party fraction won uh, quite a good number, uh, therefore, you know, revision of the constitution is not an issue. So therefore, the, the issue became much more textbooks. So that was um, the, the context of the you know, controversy. And then there was you know, the, the diet opened, and there was uh, you know, t you know, the, uh, testimonies uh, by the former uh, Japan Teachers Union officials to how textbook adoptions are bad. But the, 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 the topic quickly became to the biased textbooks. So the, the, the are sort of uh, anti-communist uh, sentiment among the politicians uh, to attack textbooks. But simultaneously, around that time, uh, the negotiation between Liberal Party and the Democratic Party, who both are the uh, two uh, major parties in the conservative bloc, uh, the, the no negotiation uh, unification of two parties are going on. So the, in the public sphere, it was a textbook attack on the diet. And behind the doors, closed doors, there are negotiations how we can be united. And actually, two parties, uh, the Liberal Party and Democratic Party, uh, didn't really agree many things. So in the negotiation table, uh, some people uh, later said, we just talked about jokes. <laughs> we couldn't talk about any, any, any political agenda because we, our positions are different. But we talked about jokes. But one thing that the both parties are comfortable talking about was textbooks, biased textbooks. So uh, basically, that was uh, you know, uh, the context. Um, even though a lot of you know, a decent politi uh, conservative politicians, politicians didn't like the uh, attack on textbooks, <coughs> which really they approved beforehand. So uh, they didn't like it, but because of this political negotiation, they couldn't criticize it because it's the one thing they can agree on. So that was 1955. Um, uh, the, actually, 1955 uh, controversy didn't really 
uh, sold well in the public either. Public are so disgusted about the stupid comments made by politicians. But, but uh, one thing it really affected was the way a Minister of Education uh, conduct, conduct uh, textbook screening system. Uh, because of the, this political nature, uh, they were able to uh, create a, a <coughs> full-time textbook examiner's position within the ministry, uh, and they were able to hire a full-time basis uh, some of the uh, right-wing historians to, send, uh, to, to screen uh, textbooks. And they really did, uh, uh, quote-unquote, a good job to uh, commenting and uh, <coughs> basic, you know, on the, some of the text of passages, including uh, some of the you know, uh, war-related issues, but in broadly uh, uh, some of the progressive issues in the textbooks. So there was uh, the, the, this uh, really uh, uh, so-called winter time in textbooks uh, continued until uh, mid-1960s. Uh, actually, uh, the thing uh, made a difference uh, was uh, historian Saburo Ienaga's uh, textbook losses, which is filed in 1965. Around that time, uh, ministry thought, well, there is a court case, so we better be a little bit cautious about how we treat textbooks. So uh, there was, and then uh, Ienaga won a landmark decision in 1970, uh, in which uh, the court uh, said uh, the specific passage, uh, and some of the, not specific passage, but um, that state uh, screening of textbooks should be a little bit more restrained, and it will be the uh, parent who can decide the content of education. It is a little bit short of you know to say uh, it is the textbook authors to decide uh, the content of education, but you know the, the, that that decision made some differences. So 1970s, there are a lot of the relaxed uh, mood writing about the historical facts. And then, um, then around that time, uh, there was a, a prime minister, was Sato Eisaku, and then um, basically he had a really uh, um, long, long tenure uh, in power as a prime minister. But as he uh, stepped down, uh, Japan again enters a really, uh, uh, not the Japan, but the liberal democratic party, who was the ruling party, uh, which was formed in 1955, actually uh, the period, period of internal strife. Uh, basically, a lot of uh, uh, fractions and uh, a lot of, in Japan, uh, the becoming a prime minister, even a short while, is the uh, end of the, you know, the, 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 the so the, get, you know, end point for the, a lot of, you know, ambitious uh, politicians, so who will succeed. Uh, was the issue, and actually um, uh, Tanaka Kakue, um, who was a sort of, you know, a little bit, uh, not, not really hawk, but, you know, uh, a, a very popular politician came into power, uh, but uh, then, um, uh, but at the same time, I think he was a really uh, a politician who believes in uh, the idea of money talks. So there are a lot of corruptions and a lot of you know, uh, financial issues. So he stepped down, and then uh, there were in his, his uh, friend came to the prime minister, but the other uh, fractions are not happy about it. So there are disarray in the uh, Liberal Democratic Party. Um, then uh, actually, um, uh, his uh, one uh, his best uh, ally. Uh, Ohira Masayoshi became a prime minister, but at that point uh, he couldn't get hold on the uh, everybody and uh, Liberal Democrat Party on the same same table. Uh, basically, there are uh, some uh, minor split, and therefore uh, there was um, a no confidence vote uh, for Ohira's uh, prime ministership. So therefore, uh, he decided to have a general election, and. Uh, Okay, <laughs> and then uh, basically uh, in, the, in the middle of the election, Ohira died, uh, be in part because of that uh, actually uh, LDP, uh, instead of losing, but really uh, he get a huge win. Um, so then um, after that, uh, basically um, young hawks in the LDP department, uh, LDP party, um, basically uh, started attacking textbooks. 
and then uh, it, it is uh, one way for young politicians to get names to you know by by doing a textbook test. So um, so it became uh, 1981, 1982 uh, um, international controversy over textbook issue. And at that time, the Ministry of Education has been doing uh, censorship, you know, uh, all the time. However, uh, in the here and there, it became the international issues, of which was in this case, which was 1981, 1982. And then uh, the, the 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 media reported was important in uh, in uh, in becoming a really huge uh, dispute. And then as soon as a uh, media report came in, uh, there was a protest from the, a lot of Asian nations, including China, uh, South Korea, North Korea, Vietnam. Uh, um, so uh, also one thing, uh, uh, nationally, uh, there are a lot of protests from Okinawan uh, people. So uh, the government backed, uh, uh, relatively treated, and then uh, decided uh, to hear a little bit in a room for, uh, to write a uh, more progressive history. But around, uh, but uh, but the irony is after this you know, textbook you know, controversy, actually who became, uh, the person who became <coughs> prime minister was Nakasone, uh, and Nakasone is uh, uh, basically a uh, young hawk who made a name on textbook which is 1955. So basically, uh, it's a very uh, contradictory moment, and then um, Nakatone, Nakasone also had a long tenure uh, as a prime minister. And after Nakasone resigned, uh, again uh, LDP was uh, in uh, in 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 a situation of disarray. Uh, and then uh, 1990, uh, the big issue, uh, the, the the comfort women issue, uh, resurfaced. There was you know a little bit you know uh, the comfort women issue here and there in the past, but 1990 was a sort of a benchmark. Uh, in which uh, around this period uh, the, the issue became really, really huge because of some international situations. Uh, uh, the Korean feminists are strong at the time, Korean, uh, South Korea uh, actually democratized uh, the country, so they gave uh, some voice in the international leader to talk to the uh, Japanese government. Of course, the Japanese government uh, flatly denied at the beginning. But uh, as uh, uh, the former comfort women uh, really took a stand uh, to, testi uh, to testify what happened, uh, the government retreated and did a certain hearing. And then uh, they admitted uh, there was uh, some uh, in indirect and direct cohesion uh, to make uh, to recruit as well as to uh, make comfort women work in the uh, comfort women's uh, facilities. Uh, but that was also the time actually LVP lost uh, um, control of the majority on the diet. So uh, basically, uh, as soon as uh, this you know, statement, you know, the corner statement came, uh, I think a few days after, uh, basically LDP was out of power, and there were a seven-party coalition government formed. And uh, the prime minister Hosokawa, uh, when he the, his first address uh, said. Uh, uh, the, 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 the last war was a war of aggression, and then um, that was a wrong, mistaken war. Uh, it, it, that his statement really angered uh, right-wing politicians as well as right-wing constituencies. And then uh, basically uh, the, uh, the right-wing uh, politicians uh, in some way reunited across the party line to make a stand against the Hosokawa's statement. And there are a lot of issues. Uh, I have to stop it. Yes. But, uh, but um, so this is the context, you know, uh, the controversy uh, which continues today uh, came uh, in the public and still uh, Japan is debated. Thank you. Uh, let me make uh, some final points. Uh, Yoshiko began by noting uh, the ways in which the textbook controversy emerged out of the failure of the central effort of the Japanese right uh, in the wake of the end of the occupation, and that was the desire to revise the Constitution, especially to revise Article 9 uh, that was uh, placing a lock uh, on the Japanese military. 
they couldn't go this route because of the, uh, the ways in which uh, Japanese politics divided with a socialist party never able to take power, uh, except for the briefest moments, but able to block constitutional uh, revision. And this meant that nationalists, neo-nationalists, uh, uh, chose the, uh, the textbooks uh, as a major focus uh, for their political attacks. It's interesting that today we're at a moment when the constitutional issue is right on the front burner uh, once again, and indeed it is the primary uh, goal of the Abe administration to revise the Constitution, specifically Article 9. Uh, and at the same time, the present prime minister is a, has made his career uh, on two points. Uh, above all, he made it on uh, North Korea issues, but the second point is as a uh, proponent of revising the Constitution and uh, eliminating retrograde textbooks of the type that we're, uh, that we're talking about. So these issues are absolutely central to Japanese politics. And of course, everything we've been saying in many ways has, against, has a background of implicit comparisons to Germany. Uh, we're talking about a country in the wake of major defeat uh, and occupation coming to terms with its history, uh, but in ways uh, that uh, contrast with those chosen for the most part uh, by German uh, textbook writers. Uh, let me say uh, just a couple of things about uh, war and memory uh, in, uh, in the Japanese context. A very nice example from the 1950s uh, well, first, to begin by noting that one of the things that has struck us in reviewing this 50-year history uh, is the enormous continuity of central themes throughout. Above all, the defense of empire, the defense of war, the defense of Japan against charges that it was guilty of war crimes uh, and, and so forth. A very nice example uh, came from the uh, textbook examiners in 1955, controversy when they said, don't write bad things about Japan in describing the Pacific War, even though they are facts, represent them in a romantic, romantic in a Japanese manner. The implication was that the text should be more like a historical novel. Um, they said, the Pacific War is not a historical term. Call it the Great East, Asia, Great East Asian War, Dai Toa Senso. That was the official term for the war. Uh, and something as innocent as the Pacific War was taken up by anti-war people af after the war. Uh, so um, this is an attempt to go back. It's an attempt to go back to uh, 1930s war nationalism uh, in many ways. The second thing that we try to emphasize is the ways in which, especially beginning with the 1981-82 controversy, that this is not an issue for Japan. This is an issue for the region. Well just as you're talking about recognizing that Japan's history is not its own history. Of course, uh, especially the history of war and empire uh, doesn't concern just uh, Japan. Uh, and these issues became international controversies in 1981-82 uh, after uh, newspapers uh, in Japan reported on the toning down of descriptions in previous texts of Japanese wartime atrocities uh, in Asian countries. And uh, it became a domestic issue in Okinawa in particular when it toned down uh, issues relating to uh, shutanjiketsu, forced, compulsory forced suicide in Norma Field's evocative term for Japanese soldiers forcing Okinawan people to commit suicide. So these references were taken out as unsuitable for Japanese students. Um, to read about. Actually, there are interesting questions about what is suitable, especially we'll come to this in the Comfort Women, which is the next example I want to briefly mention. The issue of the Comfort Women became the central issue around historical memory as well as textbooks uh, in the 1995 to the present issue. And as you noted, uh, the Japanese Prime Minister apologized to Mr. Bush for the comfort women. Uh, and Mr. Bush accepted his apology. Uh, but he didn't apologize to the comfort women. And he didn't establish a government program for this. But anyhow, uh, this issue surfaced in the text. And perhaps surprisingly, uh, our, our, our paper is all about um, the ways in which the Japanese right and the Ministry of Education criticized text. But we didn't really spell out how these things got into the text. They got into the text because Japanese because Japan isn't a monolith, because Japanese historians did the research, because Asian peoples, starting with Asian feminists uh, and Korean comfort women and others, 
recovered women in eventually 11 countries spoke out about their issues. And they didn't do that until 1989 for the first time. It had to be the Cold War had to end first. Democracy in countries like Korea, Taiwan, and some others have to happen uh, second. And then the issues exploded, and they soon, and, and Japanese historians had to find the smoking gun. The Japanese government had always said, this oral history stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't count. It's not history. History is about official documents. Well, uh, Yoshimi Yoshiaki probably is the person that Norm is bringing in, but I don't know, um, yes. found the document in a military archive that, uh, that made the case. Uh, and then the Japanese government felt that it was forced. So the famous Kono statement of 1993, uh, of accepting the comfort women, apologizing for them, uh, this is a controversy again this year because the Abe government rejected that statement. Um, that came out of this research and it came out of the international controversy. And in the years that followed, all seven of the major textbooks uh, had some reference to the comfort woman. And some had rather, rather good explanation of what this was all about. This term comfort women is a very peculiar term, you know. We don't have it in English. Uh, and it's, it's obfuscation. But the Japanese term military comfort woman, Jugun Yangfu, uh, is a little bit more reminiscent of the sexual slavery uh, that went on. Anyhow, this did get into the textbooks uh, and did become the center of the controversy. So in the 1990s, a neo nationalist movement emerges, challenging, uh, above all, the descriptions of the comfort women, but other issues as well. Uh, and this became a major issue both in Japanese politics and in the international politics of the region, and would be reflected, uh, Michael has mentioned, it, it's not just textbooks, because there's a, a continuum from textbooks to manga, comics, to film, to literature, and so forth, all of the same issues being played out uh, and fought out there uh, as well. So um, we wish to argue that the consequences of decisions about textbooks reach far beyond the classroom. They reach the level of national, regional, and global politics. Um, and uh, we've tried to illustrate this for, uh, for Japan. Um, in criticizing uh, Japanese textbook treatments and in criticizing the censorship of textbooks about issues that need to be uh, discussed within Japanese society, uh, I think it's important that an American begin by saying that if we only criticize Japan and don't criticize American textbooks on precisely these grounds, that we should keep our mouths shut. But maybe if we do both, uh, and maybe if we examine these issues comparatively, maybe if we note the ways in which nationalism uh, in our own country and many other countries poison the possibility of a common history, as difficult as that, maybe that's never possible, but it's a nice ideal. Uh, it seems to me that unless we look in multiple directions, starting right here uh, at home, uh, that, um, that it's not clear that we have a basis uh, from which to, uh, to critique. So let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, do, do you want to trade places? Yes, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I'm talking on the politics of history textbooks in India. <clears throat> um, in 1969, a bright young historian um, in her late 20s was asked by the education minister of the time uh, to do a survey of the textbooks in India. <clears throat> this young historian, Romila Thapa, wrote a critique of the existing textbooks, which in some way became uh, which acquired great historical significance. Um, <clears throat> she argued that all the available textbooks in India at that time uh, were uh, textbooks uh, which were shoddily produced, um, badly written, and contained ideas which no professional historian of the time would agree with. Uh, they were 
not in some way, they were not uh, in keeping with the professional standards of history writing of the time. <clears throat> Thapa's critique, I suggest, uh, was in a way a part of a wider demand for professionalization of history. Uh, professional history, in some sense, had, had developed in India from the early uh, years of the 20th century. But uh, textbooks, school textbooks, were written primarily by non-professionals still, till the 1950s. <clears throat> um, what Thapa was demanding is that the textbooks ought to re reflect the best standards of the time. Uh, and they should reflect and contain the advances in historical knowledge, which was uh, clear and which was evident in the academic, text, uh, academic te texts of the time. This demand for professionalization fused with a demand for standardization. Uh, the, the new nation state had come into being in the 1940, late 1940s, but for uh, the first, first decade, first 10 years of it, nothing really was done about textbooks. Uh, there were no uniform textbooks which were um, read by students and no uh, standardization, no institutions which implemented or looked oversaw the textbooks in India. <clears throat> uh, the citizens, in some sense, the citizens of India uh, needed, the new nation state felt, the citizens of India needed to read a single textbook which were produced and overseen by a national institution. Uh, in 1961, the NCERT is set up, National Council of Educational Research and Training, and within the provinces, SCRTs are set up, which are the state boards of educational training. Uh, within a few years, the uh, examination system in the early 60s is unified, uh, the higher secondary board comes up, and subsequently, the central board of uh, central board CBSC central board of uh, examination comes up, which uh, in some way homogenizes and unifies the entire examination system within India. <clears throat> but what I would suggest is that while there is a move here um, towards professionalization and standardization, the, the will of the state. Uh, to produce a unitary text, to produce a text which will be read by everybody within the country, this will of the state could never be implemented in practice. And I think it's important to recognize and realize that there were many silent, invisible ways in which there was a negotiation with this text which was produced. And these invisible and often not so noticeable uh, uh, negotiations are extremely important to understand what is going on, what goes on within the country in a certain sense. Because if we believe, as the education, uh, as the historians who produce the new text continue to believe, that the NCRT is what produce uh, the, the ideas contained in the NCRT textbooks is what socializes people as citizens of the new state, there, was a, there is a problem in that argument. It is to claim too much for ourselves because we are producing these national textbooks. <clears throat> uh, these battles which were carried on uh, over the years, I think uh, need to be noted. And they were carried on at various levels. Uh, and these battles, I'll just mention a few forms that these negotiations took. Now, the NCRT produced um, the national textbooks, and over the years, the circulation of these textbooks increased. Uh, anywhere between um, 300 to 400,000 by the 1990s uh, was the print run of any single textbook. That is, over a few years, you can imagine how, what the print runs would be. Now, in the uh, beginning of the century, the print runs annually for every textbook up to class 10 is over uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The lower classes are even higher. Is over seven or eight hundred thousand uh, per textbook per edition, <clears throat> and often you have to rerun that uh, over the year. But yet, this is a very small part of the total market of textbooks. Not more than ten percent of uh, the reading public, the students, read these textbooks. <clears throat> uh, once the syllabus is outlined. And once it is uh, put up on the board and circulated, private publishers begin to produce their textbooks. And they are not, their texts are not subjected to any national scrutiny. Uh, the private publishers persuade the local, uh, uh, local intellectuals in different places, offer them handsome, uh, uh, handsome royalties, uh, and um, create textbooks, which in some way 
are different from the NCRT textbooks. If you compare them, you can see that very many differences are there. <clears throat> but beyond this, uh, private publishers, uh, what was uh, what is important is that the NCRT itself over time had to allow space for alternative texts, uh, al alternative kinds of texts to come in. That is, there was increasing pressure over time for uh, local ideas, lo uh, regional uh, uh, histories and local histories to be integrated within the text. And therefore, what the NCRT allowed is to uh, allow the uh, SCRTs, the pro provincial organizations, to produce texts in which one part, one chapter or two chapters will be uh, reflecting uh, the regional histories and will be written by local historians. Therefore, while there is a unification at one level, there is a localization, provincialization, regionalization, or inscription of the local onto the national. A hybridization of text takes place. <clears throat> this becomes, uh, this is carried out in a variety of uh, other ways where the inscription can, we can see the inscription within the text. That is, the <clears throat> SCRTs themselves begin producing other kinds of texts which are SCRT textbooks where a few chapters of the NCRT are taken and mo many chapters of the locally written chapters of the uh, SCRTs are put together and that's permitted. That is uh, again permitted to allow the, the provincial, regional to merge with the national. So again we see a process of hybridization taking place where the local and the national uh, have a dialogue and create a new kind of structure. But beyond this, there are other processes which become important and again very, very important in understanding the local mind as they are shaped by textbook. One is the process of translation. All these English texts are translated in uh, vernaculars and we know that process of translation is a process of transculturation. That is, uh, the, inter the person who is translating weaves in, in many ways local metaphors, local ways, they interpret the, uh, the national text in the way that they want. And that again is not very well scrutinized or anything to homogenize that in. So therefore, the vernacular and the local again gets ins uh, inscribed onto the national. And what is produced is a different kind of a text altogether. And finally, on this point, ultimately the texts are read in the classrooms by teachers and students and they're interpreted by teachers in their own way. There is no way you can uniformly homogenize or uniformly create a text which is accepted by everyone, read in the way that you want to. The historians might want a democratic, national, secular citizens to emerge through this process of socialization, but what happens is a different story. So we have to look at, if we have to understand the impact of a text and what a text does, we need to understand what goes on in classrooms. And there are studies which show how the texts are subverted in a variety of ways, reinterpreted, localized, uh, and offered to students in, their, in the particular ways that a teacher would like in a different place. So there is here a politics. There is here a politics where uh, the local and the national have a particular kind of a dialogue. There is a politics of homogenization, standardization, professionalization, which, is, uh, which comes up against the barriers to this process in a variety of ways. <clears throat> And this is something which needs to be kept in mind when one is looking at the impact of textbooks. The textbooks, <clears throat> uh, while this negotiation is going on at a lower level, the public wars, the public debates ultimately were around the national textbooks produced by NCRT. The other textbooks do not really come up for debate in the same way. And that's an important point to remember. Now, I think the reason for this is that these textbooks acquired a symbolic value. They were written by the finest historians of the time, and uh, the more the, uh, the more public and uh, the public, uh, uh, in some sense, um, uh, reacts by evaluating the influ uh, the influence and impact of texts over people. The more influential they are seen to be, the more. Uh, the, uh, the more they are scrutinized by the public uh, in order to understand what the, those texts are. And this is not a scrutiny which is turned, uh, uh, which uh, the public publish, uh, the private publishers um, are subjected to. <clears throat> and secondly, what happens here is that because this NCRT is a public institution, therefore there is a demand for public accountability. There's a demand that uh, there, there is a feeling that we have given you the charge and the responsibility to uh, deliver a public good. And if we have given you the charge, you are responsible to the public 
uh, and we have to judge. The, it, the public is the court of opinion, the court where uh, a judgment will be made on the text that you produce. Now, this is the premise of the debate and discussion which takes place over the NCRT textbooks. I would like very briefly to talk about um, the NCRT textbooks as they emerge in the 60s and 70s in the debate and conclude by uh, talking about the new moves that we are making to get away from these textbooks and what are the uh, ways in which we are rethinking the text now. <clears throat> in the 60s, these new textbooks which come up in the 1960s and 70s, um, I would say sought to do two kinds of things. One, they sought to decolonize the text. These, the texts which circulated at that time were, um, uh, 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 were in many ways, th th these texts contained, the textbooks contained uh, colonial uh, assumptions and categories which were taken over from uh, British scholars, colonial scholars who wrote at that time. And they found their ways in the uh, textbooks which circulated in the 1950s. So one of the first things that the new historians wanted to do is to critique all these assumptions and categories and rework the framework in which uh, the history was to be written. Within the colonial assumptions, of course, you had a notion of a past, I'm schematizing and uh, um, uh, simplifying here, a notion of uh, uh, representation of the past where uh, in many ways the past was presented not by the Orientalists but by subsequent historians as a past was barbaric, primitive, stagnant, backward. Agriculture didn't develop, industries were not really uh, um, developed. There was chaos, absence of a rational order, uh, no laws, a despotic government, all the usual stereotypical notions. Now these are uh, critiqued and uh, uh, subjected to scrutiny and an alternative picture is offered where the past appears as dynamic, as changing, as full of flux and change, and uh, processes of transformation were analyzed. In the colonial text, you have a notion of a rupture which uh, leads uh, to the, the uh, modern period where col under colonial rule development and growth take place. And in the nationalist text, you have an argument that there is a tragic history of decline, stagnation, um, etc. Now, this is one part of the object. There's a second thing which this, these texts are doing, which is to um, critique the communal bias, what is seen in Indian textbooks as the communal bias within the text. Now, what, uh, now this is a specifically uh, specific category, which is um, uh, the, the category communal is used in a particular way within India. It is not something which is used in the same sense elsewhere. And the specificity needs to be uh, remembered. And it would become clear as I talk about it. Uh, <clears throat> writing a decade and a half after independence, these historians, um, broadly left-wing, radical liberals, nationalists, they felt the need to rework the text in such a way uh, that uh, the text could become the basis of the creation of a new secular national democratic uh, culture. They would become the basis of uh, of citizens who would think in secular democratic ways. Uh, they were aware of uh, the trauma, they, were, they had all experienced the trauma of partition where thousands of Hindus and Muslims killed each other and they wanted to purge all the ideas which might feed into communal uh, categories and uh, conceptions of the time. <clears throat> so the textbooks were central to the process, were seen as central to the process of remaking of the mind, mentality, common sense of the people. Secularization of the society, democratization of the society, creation of a national culture. And this is something which is again is, uh, uh, central to this uh, process of rewriting of textbooks in the 60s and 70s. Now this was done in a variety of ways. I'll mention three things here for just uh, so that it can become part of a discussion later. First, there was the question of temporality, which at one level was a question of chronology and periodization. Colonial officials, uh, or rather the Orientalists in the late 18th, early 19th century, late 18th, early 19th century, had classified and periodized Indian history into uh, Hindu history, that is the ancient period, um, Muslim history, and the British history. Now, this is a categorization which was taken over by the nationalists and then became popular within the com communal writings of Indian history. Now, this categorization was something which was questioned because 
historians said that this in some way reflects an understanding of India where religion colors everything. Religion is the essence of India, therefore periods, uh, times, people, every, everything has to be understood in terms of religion. Could an entire period be read as Hindu? Could an entire period be read as Muslim? Their argument was that this is a communal, in some sense, a communal categorization now, which had orientalist roots, and this forces us to conceive of entire periods as Hindu and Muslim, and therefore we should rethink these categorizations and see them as ancient medieval modern. So therefore one way, one, one issue was a reworking of the chronology and decommunalization of periodization and temporality. But the question of temporality is de obviously deeper than simply a process, a question of chronology. Uh, and what is this deeper temporality? Now, the, the question is, how does a period appear to be within the textbooks? In, <clears throat> in the textbooks, in the communal textbooks, the Hindu, all that is of value, all that is authentic, all that you celebrate is projected back into the ancient past, that is the Hindu past. The Hindu past becomes the moment of origin for everything that you value today within society. And you see a unilinear teleological move uh, over time, disrupted by the Muslim period. The Muslim period is the, the big uh, 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 um, interruption and the juncture where there is a process of decline. So you have a glorious period at the end and then a process of decline which leads to the present where, the, where you need to return to the ancient period in order to build the premises of new society. So this meant a particular way of temporalizing particular periods, connoting it as tragic or glorious. Now this again was rethought now uh, and uh, the Hindu period, the, uh, the, the ideas of glorious Hindu period were unpacked, the ideas of the tragic uh, or uh, cruel uh, Muslims was unpacked to demonstrate that the history is much more complicated than these simple uh, temporalizations um, uh, um, hel um, you know, um, and cannot be understood through these simple processes of communal temporalization. <clears throat> Secondly, there was a question of origins. Uh, and which is linked up with the question of indigeneity, the problem of indigeneity. Uh, who, the question was, who were the original inhabitants in India? That's the question which was posed by the communal historians. And this is something um, which inevitably uh, became a subject of debate and discussion. Um, now this is a question which has been debated elsewhere in Australia, in America, and we know that till very recently, in the textbooks in America and Australia, uh, the indigenous people did not appear as actors in history. White history was uh, constituted by erasing the history of the indigenous people. Now in India, this question of origin and indigeneity uh, is played out, is debated in an interesting way, which again is very important for the debate as it unfolds over time. Now in India, the communal historians, I continue to use the category, the Hindu right. Now for the Hindu right, the, uh, the claim that Hindu, that the present day Indians, the Brahmins and the Hindus are original, originally they were Aryans is something which is very, very important. So there are two claims which are made, that is, Hindus are Aryans, and a second claim, that is, Hindus are original inhabitants of India. Now, if you make this claim that Hindus are Aryans, and you trace your genealogy and lineage from the Aryans, and if you make an equally assertive claim that you are originally indigenous, then you get into a problem. Because history showed, historians were showing that Aryans actually came from outside. They were pastoralists who came from outside and gradually settled in India over time. Now, how do you negotiate this problem? Now, one of the ways was to say, uh, to deny that Aryans came from outside, and also to deny equally that Indus Valley civilization, which historians were arguing predated the Aryans in India, 
could not have been um, uh, prior to the Aryans. Because if you say there was a flourishing culture in India before the Aryans came, then you cannot be the original inhabitants, you cannot trace your lineage to the Aryans. Uh, therefore, there is a problem here of uh, uh, origin and uh, etc., which uh, uh, had to be negotiated. Uh, and this leads to again a, a huge debate over the next two decades. Uh, third, <clears throat> there is a question of fundamental categories. Within communal history, the framing category is Hindu and Muslim. You understand history as a negotiation and conflict between the Hindus and Muslims, and you read the earlier history, uh, the Muslim period, as a history of discord between uh, Hindus and Muslims, and you see uh, that discord and conflict played out in the present. And what the uh, nationalist democratic historians were trying to do was to project back into the past, in the medieval period, a history of harmony, of syncretism, of uh, living togetherness, and critiquing all the communal stereotypes. That these are stereotypes built by communalism, that these stereotypes were inverted, and there were sh people, uh, history books showed that these boundaries, which are seen as hard boundaries, are not really so hard. They are more porous, they are open, and people live together and and acted together and there was a history of conviviality. Now all these issues actually became uh, issues which um, upset the right wing, the, the arguments of the uh, right wing and led to violent debates and discussions. Uh, and the discussions um, uh, took on a form uh, where there were criticisms in the popular press, not they, these were not by historians, mostly by uh, right-wing uh, official, um, right-wing activists. And then in 1977, when the Janta Party, that's a coalition of parties, came to power, they actually um, uh, withdrew the textbooks which had been introduced, and again, and which led to another debate in 1999 when the Hindu uh, uh, Hindu. Uh, uh, right-wing party again came to power, these textbooks were first purged of what they considered objectionable elements, you know, reference to beef eating in the ancient India, etc. And then again, uh, uh, again, which raises the question again of sayability, something about, uh, you know, questions of prostitution in America or comfort women in Japan, that what is sayable in a textbook and what is not. And the argument was, even if this is a fact, even if they did eat meat in the fact, this is not sayable in public because you cannot talk about it in textbook. Now, this is an important issue which we need to discuss in any sense. But um, uh, the, then the textbooks were removed, and the new textbooks that the NCRT uh, brought in were uh, textbooks which for the first time embodied and expressed and articulated all the communal ideas that were circulating in the time at, uh, earlier on, but which had not got into the textbooks in some sense. Then, in, the, in uh, two years back, three years back, a shift took place. Um, and that is where we come in as new uh, uh, historians doing a new, uh, new set of textbooks for NCRT. Now, over the last, and I'll spend five minutes summarizing uh, this argument. Over the last three decades, the arguments on the textbooks many of us felt and continue to feel got locked within a frame of a, of a framework of debate where the opposition between Hindus, Hind, uh, between secularism and communalism became the defining, uh, uh, de defining theme. Now, this, was, this debate uh, created a situation where to critique the old nationalist, democratic, secular textbooks became a problem because every critique was seen as something which might create the premises and the basis of uh, consolidation of the communal. The anxiety about the spread of communalism, the need to oppose communalism, led to a silence over internal differences within the academics. Therefore, although actually historical writing had changed over the last 30 years, the uh, advances within historical writing uh, ensured that the frames of reference of the 70s were not no longer the frames through which historians in the 1990s were looking at history. Uh, gender history had made it clear that all history is gendered. Ecological history had made it clear that we need to be careful of and be sensitive to ecological issues when we uh, read history. Cultural history made it clear that you know culture shapes our ideas, actions, uh, uh, defines history. Um, histories of the subaltern or lower classes or uh, histories from below 
had made it clear that uh, the history of the marginal and the repressed is something which should enter the uh, should become visible should be explored yet none of this was there in the textbooks so there was this feeling of unease yet nobody was saying anything so uh, we felt in 19, 2003 when some of us were asked to come and help in the rethinking of textbooks in india we felt maybe it's the time that we can actually bring in something new think of new ideas <coughs> bring in the arguments, uh, um, you know, some way the ideas which are there in academic history, they should enter the textbooks of the time. Um, this was also a special conjuncture where uh, Krishna Kumar, um, a democratic uh, liberal uh, educationist had taken over the NCRT and he gave us the freedom to think and rethink the curriculum and the syllabus in the way we wanted. So many, many critical minded uh, social scientists got involved in reworking the curriculum within India. And many of us historians, about 60, 50, 60 historians, along with teachers got involved in this new project of reworking the NCRT textbooks. Um, this led to a new cycle of debate and new controversy. And this controversy now was a controversy in which we were attacked not by the right wing, but by certain sections of the left. The left became the most vociferous critics of uh, the new uh, experiments and uh, ideas that we were operating with. And we had expected this. We knew that this would come because there will be anxieties which will be provoked. But what are these anxieties? I mentioned three points and then I'll um, stop. The earlier textbooks were narratives of the nation. Uh, the idea of the unity of, the, uh, unity of India was in some way projected back into the past in medieval India onto ancient India. And you saw the unilinear unfolding of India from the ancient to modern times. Um, the first problem that we had to face is whether we can get away from such a narrative. Is it possible to write this kind of a history textbook uh, for the nation in a certain sense, which gets away from the nationalist narrative. Um, we did not offer a radical critique of the nation state, but we felt it is possible to problematize the idea. And we do this in a variety of, through a variety of different strategies. First, what we suggest in, uh, suggested in the uh, way we titled the class six, seven, eight book, that is the lower secondary book, is that uh, instead of history of India, ancient India, medieval India, modern India, we uh, entitled them Our Pasts One, Our Pasts in plural, two, and Our Pasts Three. Our is a problematic category, but still we felt that by calling, talking of our past, we bring in the multiplicity of past, we bring in the multiplicity of narratives, we say that there is no one unilinear narrative from the past to the present. And this creates uh, a tension between different narratives which we can actually work out in the text. So there are the pastoralists or the peasants or the artisans or the lower classes or the tribals or the urban class. Uh, we look at their uh, past and their stories but don't try to gel them together into a homogeneous past which unfolds uh, seamlessly from the past to the present. Secondly, what we did was to suggest um, that um, we should study not simply a general history of India, but come down to the local. So one move is to move from the national to the local. We move from the general to the particular in order to build an idea of the variety which goes on in India, the, uh, the variety of histories that unfolds, not to make these histories as instances of the national histories. The local does not become a site for the playing out of the national. Now that is in some way to integrate the, uh, the local and the different into the national. What we suggest is to uh, look at this local as radical difference in a certain sense, which we need to understand. The differences in stories need to be understand if we have to build the premises of conversation across cultures uh, between people. And these are stories which we need to see. So each of the chapters in every book that we are doing, it continuously moves into zooms into local areas to see local studies but keeps in mind that we sh we are not trying to uh, do n number of local studies in order to build the multiplicity of locals which constitutes the national that's not the object just two or three examples can give us an idea of that variation uh, third we did uh, in the class 10 and 9 and 10 what we do is 
um, get away from the national to the transnational in some way. We do India and the contemporary world, history of India and the contemporary world over two years. And in this, the effort is not to see, not to say that India was also a part, uh, that in India also had a modernity. It is not to suggest uh, that um, uh, there are on, uh, that modernity and the contemporary world unfolds in different ways in different countries. That's one of the objects. But also, it is more importantly to suggest that the contemporary world, that the modern world in which we live, is the product of, is constituted through a variety of historical processes and a variety of historical actions all over the world. It is conjointly produced. It is produced through a, uh, a collective history uh, which enacts and plays, is played out in a variety of different ways. So you get away from uh, Eurocentricism, but you don't necessarily provincialize Europe in that sense. Uh, that is, the Europe is very much there, but a variety of other processes going on every, every that comes into the study. So you move from the local to the national to the transnational without celebrating any of these sites as sites of history. These were not radical ideas, because uh, we know uh, that, uh, um, and we were not offering a radical critique of the nations, yet this was disturbing for uh, the historians who, who think the history that history should be a history of the nation state. Uh, two other small uh, themes uh, which I, uh, we do in this is, one is a pedagogical move. We make a pedagogical move in the new history textbooks where we try to create more open-ended texts, which again has created a problem. We suggest here um, that uh, in the earlier textbooks were all textbooks which were premised on a notion that the text is authoritative, that the historian has researched, analyzed, explored, the historian knows, and we offer, the historian offers the ideas, evidence, material to the students to learn. Now, this is a, an approach we get away from in order to suggest that in some way the text should be such that the craft of the historian, the fact how history is constructed, how history is uh, analyzed, how sources are looked at, all this should become part of the textbooks. We do this through the uh, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, through all the classes, but in class 12, we actually structure each of the chapters around an exploration of one, uh, one kind of a source from uh, literature to art, from inscriptions to oral history, each of them is analyzed at depth in terms of the problems it poses for the crafts of the historian, but opens up an issue where the, uh, the students can actually get into the text through the information and he or she is allowed to reflect on that in order to think out how history is really made. So that's another thing which we do. And uh, a third thing which we do is to bring in the everyday as a site of inquiry. And this, I think, is very important. This again, the earlier point about opening up of the text also created anxiety because historians said, what is this opening up? Now, how can you offer these kind of uh, sources or other things to the students? Because this will confuse them. We have to give them authoritative texts, truths which we know, conclusions which we have come, uh, come to. So this again has created a problem. And bringing in the everyday, the history of culture, the history of clothing, the history of sport or cricket, the history of print or the history of the novel, this again is seen as trivia in, uh, within the framework of earlier history. But our idea was that if the student begins to look at the everyday around them as having a history, that is actually in some way, uh, the, what that is, should be the purpose of uh, uh, history textbook, it should open up the world uh, to historical scrutiny. I'll end by reading the last paragraph, um, which is on transnational history, um, just to conclude whatever I'm uh, arguing. Finally, I would like to end with a comment on transnational history, which has been part of the subject uh, here. As I said, our effort has been to get away from the constricting frames of national histories. But we need to be wary of thinking about transnational histories unproblematically. Transnational histories ought not to produce another genealogy of the present. <clears throat> in an age of globalization, when global capital seeks to dominate the world and national boundaries appear as barriers, a critique of the nation state becomes part of the very logic of capital itself. 
at a time when the borders in Europe have broken down and people are thinking of a single textbook for Europe, we have to be cautious of the nature of new demands that, that will be made on the profession of history, on the history textbooks. Writing transnational histories ought not to become, yet once again, an act of tracing the origins of the present. If earlier, in the age of nationalism, histories presented the nation as a natural unity, now in the age of globalization, transnationalism as an idea will be naturalized, made to appear the only frame within which historical knowledge can be organized, ordered, presented, and authenticated. A common textbook of, for Europe will valorize Europeanness and produce an European consciousness in very much the same way as national textbooks produced and affirmed the nation. In this sense, a critique of the nation state is no, lo no longer occupies a space outside power as it did earlier, a heuristic vantage point from which a radical critique could be mounted. The critique of the nation state has become already a part of the politics of globalization. What needs to be celebrated is not particular critiques of the state, of the nation, of community, but criticality itself. Criticality, I suggest, is the only ground on which we can build the premises of a child's understanding of the world. The taking for grantedness of everything has to be unpacked for children. The historicity of everything has to be discussed. To historicize is to show how things are constituted through historical processes. And in this sense, it is to unpack the naturalness of things. The project of textbooks ought to be to develop this sense of criticality. Charles in Grau, and then uh, the comments by uh, a summary comments by President uh, Duara. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be brief, knowing we're running quite a bit behind. Um, in my talk, I'm going to uh, try to adhere to the practice of uh, placing the problems of Central Europe in a worldwide perspective. I do this when I'm speaking in former Yugoslavia and elsewhere in Central Europe because I want to make it clear as an outsider, as a Westerner, that I'm not speaking down at the peoples of Eastern and Central Europe who are very sensitive about the way in which Westerners and members of the international community intrude themselves into their lives and tell them the way things should be. And so I always try to point out that we in the West have the same challenges and the same problems, many of them unresolved. And the second thing, of course, is we are here to identify underlying structural causes. Uh, for um, the, the problems that textbooks uh, um, uh, offer us. And, uh, and I will, in fact, not just talk about textbooks, but about media in general. And two forces that I think we have to appreciate to understand why we are here. Uh, one is the process of legitimation, which this is a part of a much larger process. And the second, and something that you very rarely hear people talk about, um, and I'll do it because I'm tenured, uh, the, problems, the problems of democratization. I sometimes like to think that we, the triumph of democracy two centuries ago, we have, um, we have uh, reified the, you know, the advantages of democracy without really looking at some of the unresolved problems that continue to afflict us. And I think democratization and legitimation go hand in hand here. Now, let me begin by saying that there's no greater ridicule you can be confronted with when you're in an argument with somebody or discussion to have somebody say that even a school child knows that that's not true. Even a school child knows that this is true and what you're saying can't possibly be, be fact. Um, of course, you have to ask, what does a school child know? And how long does he or she accept that as fact? Probably to the grade, I think, in most cases. Um, certainly not all of them change their minds when they're in college, and most people don't go there anyway. Um, Social scientists, through their own research, know about these school child's myths, and they know about the inconvenient facts that never make it into the schoolroom and into school books. But social scientists have a very, and historians of course as well, have a very limited interface, uh, partly because they choose not to, but also because of the way societies are structured, where we can't inseminate as easily as the other forms of popular culture. Um, the public itself, despite what we know as academics, uh, remains largely ignorant uh, of the sort of pervasive control of people's minds by what is taught uh, initially in schools, through school books and classroom instruction, but then is uh, reinforced by television, uh, by childhood religious instruction, and parental discourse. 
uh, the importance of parents as teachers, not only reinforcing what is taught in school, but previous generations of knowledge that reaches them even before they uh, make, take their first uh, day in school. Once internalized, this message provides a prism through which all additional subsequent information has to be filtered. Uh, and, and in this sense, school books are maybe the first or one of the first of a series of media, forms of media that are part of a much greater legitimation pro process, which I would suggest to you begins where most myths are created at the creation of new states. Um, and in fact, in a few minutes, I'd like to talk about some of those states, including the United States, knowing which we're all prone to the creation of myths that then dominate us, especially in democracies. Um, but these myths that may inspire patriotism and loyalty and self-sacrifice, all these are good things. Nonetheless, we pay a, a fearful price for legitimation because it makes us sclerotic. It makes us inflexible in the ability to change. Now, during the course of, of society's lifetime, and I think I'm old enough to think of some events that have occurred in my 59 years that have, I've seen change in society. I think of November 22nd, 1963, and September 11th as two of them. We do change over time, but one thing that never changes is the past, because that has been written in granite and is impressed in everybody's memory. And oftentimes it's a very simple message that everybody can understand. That's what teaches things, teaches people best, and is virtually impregnable to any meaningful change. Now, um, individual scholars might question these things, but once again, they do not have the ability to challenge uh, the, the public perception, nor do they necessarily have the inclination to do so. Now, political leaders, what I found certainly in Central Europe is political leaders are highly educated, unlike some in our country, um, and they understand the finer points of their history, including the myths and the inconvenient facts that dare not be spoken about publicly. Uh, but one of the ironies here is that political leaders in authoritarian states can break with the national narrative. Uh, whether you're talking about somebody like Ataturk or Gorbachev or any number of authoritarian rulers in between, and as I mentioned to President yet, uh, just the, the other day, um, uh, President Hu or Chairman Hu could probably change Chinese textbooks a little bit more easily than the Prime Minister of Japan can. Uh, there's a certain, you know, like a command economy, there's a certain uh, command culture. The authoritarian leaders can break with that narrative. But in democracies, we can't. Because in a democracy, the political leaders are beholden to the base of the causative pyramid, to the electorate, and they dictate what you can say and still stand for re-election with any chance of success. Um, now, this message that democratic politicians must confront and must abide by tends to be very simple. Um, and because children are so impressionable, the message that is impressed on their brain is sort of like, like programming a disk drive or a, or a computer system. Once you put in, you program that uh, with a very simple software, it is very difficult for it to accept new information that contradicts it. Um, you sacrifice nuance, you sacrifice qualification, and you end up with a very brief national narrative that is rock solid because everybody has learned it and everybody believes it. In a minute, I'm going to talk about the Serbs, for example, and the Serbian national narrative. And whether you're talking to somebody in Belgrade or in Banja Luka in, in Republika Srpska in Bosnia or here in the south side or north side of Chicago in Libertyville or whatever, every Serb knows his history and you could fit it almost on a thumbnail. And it's identical. And it's so difficult to break with that because everybody knows that this is true. Um, by sacrificing nuance, therefore, you actually make this narrative impregnable to change. And let me uh, digress here and, and express some uh, acknowledgment that we have the same problem in the West, uh, although it hasn't led to the same kind of uh, socially destructive um, uh, phenomena. In the Anglo-Saxon world, not just Great Britain, in the whole Anglo-Saxon world, we're all taught the Magna Carta is a milestone in the path to democracy rather than a, uh, a signal triumph for the English aristocracy in the 13th century. Uh, British schools uh, talk about the triumph of the British Empire and its civilizing mission without maybe asking the people who were civilized uh, what kind of a process that really was and what motivated it. Uh, the French uh, celebrate Bastille Day every year. Uh, and, you know, the Tale of Two Cities story of the liberation of the political prisoners in the basement and the dungeon of the prison, 
when in fact we historians know there were only seven prisoners, four of them were convicted counterfeiters, two of them were lunatics, and one was a promiscuous noble who had been put there at the request of his wife. Uh, so, you know, it, it, we're, we're not talking about political prison, but that's what the symbol becomes through popular history. And in the media here of national holidays and, and, uh, and landmarks and things like this, uh, we Americans, I think, come in for uh, fulsome criticism. Uh, we all know about no taxation with rep without representation. Uh, very few Americans, I think, appreciate that the British were virtually bankrupt defending us from the French and their Indian allies and that we refuse to pay even a very small tax on it. Um, they don't recognize, as members of the Continental Congress did, especially those from the South, that the British government was trying to outlaw slavery, or at least minimize it, and that that tax on tea still offered tea cheaper than the American company's tea, which they were trying not to be undercut by. Um, we talk about liberty and freedom and human rights, but nobody talks about the all oh, 18 to 30,000 Tories who were expelled in 1783. Uh, now, you know, we have a name for those Tories today. We call them Canadians, okay? <laughs> a very significant percentage of Canada is made up of descendants of Tories, much like a very significant percentage of Austrians and West Western Germans are um, descendants of the expellees from 1945, which we also don't talk about as part of our history. Um, the founding fathers are universally portrayed as, as devout Christians, uh, even though most of them were agnostics, uh, or at the very least deists. And probably my favorite inconvenient fact that nobody talks about uh, is John Paul Jones. Everybody knows you know, that he had not just begun to fight when he was about to board the HMS Serapis off Scarborough ahead and take this ship while his own was sinking. But very, very few people know, and I would say it is tinier than 1% of the population know, that John Paul Jones' brilliant naval career ended when he was charged with raping a 14-year-old girl. Um, uh, now, admittedly, this was in Russia, and his defense was that he had paid her for his services first. But, you know, the History Channel is ru running a John Paul Jones um, uh, segment as part of its Russian Navy biography, and I eagerly awaited... Uh, there, his 15 seconds of infamy, uh, only to find that he said he was dismissed from the Russian service on trumped up charges. They wouldn't even dare to say what the trumped up charges were about. This doesn't change John Paul Jones as a hero, but it speaks to the problem we have of selective writing of history, both in the occlusion of inconvenient facts and then substituting favorable information when it's not really true, proven, or it's frankly just uh, outright myth. Um, now, though inaccurate and incomplete, uh, the myths that dominate American, French, and uh, British uh, culture are relatively harmless, irritating to be sure, but relatively harmless. They, we care have carefully cultivated a national mythology that's based on the, pro the, um, the self-acclaim of our genius, of our love for democracy, of commonly held values, and, and I think we do very little damage with the myths, um, uh, with the myths that we've created. Um, we don't have to worry about the uh, demonization of Louis the Sixteenth or George the Third. There are no monarchists stalking the, the hallways looking to reestablish some kind of a government like that. Uh, Americans don't harbor fear or resentment towards, let's say, the British. Um, we're, we're secure after two centuries of history. We are more secure and we're capable, I think, of looking at those criticisms, at least 45% of the American electorate is anyway. Um, but the problem in Central Europe is rather different. These newly created states, insecure, uh, that have had to fashion a new national narrative uh, in the last century, um, there, is, there is a real challenge. Twice in the last century, twice in the 20th century, Central Europe experienced the euphoria of gaining its freedom, of its independence, and at the same time, what it defined as democracy and what was welcomed by outsiders as democracy. But not unlike most of the Western world, uh, the peoples of Central Europe, and I certainly would apply to India as well, and China, and, and most of the West, most of the world period, is these were multi-ethnic spaces, uh, multicultural worlds uh, around which borders had been fashioned that rarely housed one overwhelmingly um, uh, homogenous group. Um, and in the process of legitimating these new states that were created largely in 1919, 
uh, what happens is you create a national identity based upon one ethnic group's dominance, its manifest destiny to rule over that space. Um, and this happens twice. It happens at the downfall of the Habsburg and Ottoman Empires, 1919 to 1923. Um, and it also happens at the downfall of the Soviet bloc, not just Soviet Communist Russia, but, but uh, the various satellite states of Western Europe. And they face the daunting task of creating a common national identity twice in the same century. Uh, and it's one on both occasions in which school books and mass media forged a national uh, self-image by creating uh, a, a history that minimizes the accomplishments of their multi-ethnic heritage. It minimizes the successes of multi-ethnic living. Um, the, quite the contrast to what's going on in the EU today where the, uh, the intellectual elites are and the bureaucrats behind them uh, are fostering an appreciation of multi-ethnicity and, and, and uh, a multilateral society. Um, not only are the achievements and the efficacy of a multi-ethnic society uh, being minimized, but also in its place justifying the creation of these uh, ethnically dominated nation states, uh, putting the state forming nation in a special place. So bringing in an historical narrative that makes one ethnic group, one national group, one state forming group somehow special. In 1919, and I'll just go up through a few of the countries, uh, Poland, you know, has this glorious pre-partition past before the 1770s and 90s when it's divided up by its three great power neighbors. Uh, and the Poles in their textbooks, of course, in their history, even before, um, in the writings of their intellectuals, this is this great society that was destroyed by three aggressive powers. But nowhere in this new narrative was any mention made of the Poland that was partitioned in the end of the 18th century was a multinational state. Uh, that it gave much more rights to non-Polish speakers and indeed to non-Catholics, including Jews, than anybody in the 20th century is willing to recognize. Czechoslovakia uh, basically turned its back on its Habsburg past, which only could be seen as a prescription for, uh, for oppression and suffering. Um, and you have, I think, a good example of this is in the, in the, uh, the picture the Czechs have of the revolutionary emperor, Joseph II, who frees the serfs, in not just the whole Habsburg monarchy, but of course specifically in Bohemia, where some of the worst uh, feudal uh, obligations existed, uh, he spreads literacy. He actually makes laws, he and his mother, Maria Theresa, make laws that require all those Czech peasants not only to learn how to read and write, but to learn how to read and write in Czech. Okay? Um, and this great legacy, which was promoted by Germans in what becomes Czechoslovakia, at the same time is abhorred by the Czechs because their identity, the symbol that Joseph II represents is an edict that he issued in 1784 requiring that bureaucrats all know German because of the kind of efficiency with which we've already discussed, uh, touched on uh, earlier today, that all bureaucrats should know German so they can communicate with each other, which is interpreted, I would suggest misinterpreted as an attempt to Germanize the whole society. That's what Joseph II is remembered as. And after 1919, every statue of Joseph II is torn down, or if the government manages to intervene, at least peacefully removed and put in museums and back rooms somewhere. Uh, at the same time, when German language movie houses are being, uh, being closed down, in some cases burned down and looted, um, because of the desire to simply eliminate, to purge this, any sense of a German contribution to Czechoslovakia's new history. I'll give you one more example, since I won't dwell much on northern Central Europe, and that is uh, in Czechoslovakia, um, the national narrative that nationalists already had begun to nurture in the 19th century, which becomes part of the school book literature in the 20th, is the lesson of the Thirty Years' War. Thirty Years' War is a part of the Counter-Reformation where the Catholic government uh, experiences a rebellion in the Bohemian crown lands, puts down that rebellion and re-Catholicizes Bohemia. The fact that the Habsburgs were German uh, and that a majority of the Bohemians were Czech speaking is converted by 19th century history and any Czech, if they pick out their thumbnail, will tell you it was German against Slav. Uh, they don't point out that of the 23 men whom Emperor Ferdinand II strung up by the Charles Bridge after the revolt was put down, two-thirds of them were German speakers. 
uh, and that the Counter-Reformation was impressed on the Czechs in Czech, um, which is to say that it was not a language thing, and in fact many of the nobles who were purged were German speakers, and many of those who came in were Czechs, rewarded for their Catholic loyalty. In Romania, after 1919, uh, the transformation of a state that is only 63% Romanian speaking into a state whose history totally focuses on the history of Romania. In multi-ethnic areas like the Banat, the Bukovina, and Transylvania, uh, teachers who are not Romanian uh, and curricula which talk about things other than the history of Romanians are quietly purged from the ranks. Yugoslavia, originally its name is the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, so only two-thirds or so of the population is even given the kind of legitimacy of being part of the state-forming nation, much like Czechoslovakia, two groups, even though they're only about 60% of the population of the state. Uh, in Yugoslavia, the whole discourse of a South Slav nation uh, that is accepted by Serbs, the dominant group, is one that really was formed by them. Uh, the incomplete, tendentious narrative that informs Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia's history may explain in part the ease with which Czechoslovakia was partitioned in 1938 um, as four of its six nationalities fled this, actually five of the six nationalities fled the scene uh, before the, uh, the outbreak of the, of the Second World War, and Yugoslavia where, except for the Serbs and to some extent Slovenes, uh, who were their the balance they used to get a majority in the, in the Yugoslav parliament, uh, virtually every other ethnic group was more than happy to leave that state in ruins when Hitler invades. Now, when the communists take over in 1945, these textbooks, of course, have to be grossly modified. Um, communism briefly superimposes the idea in Yugoslavia of unity and brotherhood. Um, and this discourse of unity and brotherhood trying to eradicate the centrifugal forces of national identity. Uh, and you begin to see in these textbooks a certain limited attack on nationalist uh, paramilitary formations, the Chetniks, the Serbian nationalists who were monarchistic and fascist uh, and committed uh, tremendous war crimes against uh, Muslims in particular, uh, uh, as well as Croats. And the Croatian Ustasha, one of the most evil of the fascist uh, spin-offs of Hitler's Germany, uh, whose crimes committed against Jews and Serbs and gypsies were so horrendous that even the Nazi officials observing them uh, wrote back to Berlin in horror at the way in which people were being uh, murdered. It was very inefficient, apparently. Um, but what the Yugoslav textbooks do in limited criticism of these national groups, they didn't want to make it unlimited because they knew that the Serbian narrative was still alive among parents, among adults who had been educated before communism took over. Uh, what it is, it's sort of like, well, you're all familiar with Karl Marx's uh, claim that, um, was it religion is the opiate of the people? Well, if, if religion is the opiate of the people, communism in Yugoslavia was sort of the methadone of the people because it, <laughs> it, it imposes uh, a, a, a crutch. It, 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 it eliminates the, the craving, but it doesn't solve the problem. And one of the reasons why it doesn't solve the problem, as one U.S. diplomat told me shortly after, um, after the wars in Yugoslavia, he said, you know, if only Tito had lived 10 more years, or only if Milosevic had taken 10 more years to come on the scene, a whole new generation would have been educated under the communists, and maybe they would have been able to divorce themselves from the national narrative that had survived from the 1830s up until 1945, uh, up until 1941 in Serbia. Uh, but the fact is school books are, have this way of coming back and and undermining any chance of change later on. And it's what I sometimes call the Frankenstein effect. You legitimate a society, you create a particular narrative, you do it partly because you're proud of what you've created and you believe the myths, but at the same time, once you've done that and it gets into the textbooks and popular culture reinforces this, the two go hand in hand, then future generations are not gonna be able to change this simplistic message 
especially in a democracy. <laughs> now, after the fall of communism, we saw this second wave of freedom and democracy, which quickly degenerated into, of course, a horrific war in Yugoslavia. And the new textbooks that have come out of post-Tito uh, Yugoslavia in Slovenia, for example, uh, they don't like the inconvenient fact that Slovenia really benefited tremendously from the multi-ethnic Yugoslav state. Uh, the Slovene state today, which is really uh, uh, a very important member of the, well, a very representative member of the EU, economically in particular, uh, really benefits from the Kingdom of Yugoslavia created in 1919. That's not part of their textbook. Still, their narrative is we were oppressed by the Yugoslav state just as we were oppressed by the Habsburgs. Serbian textbooks, uh, um, uh, they overlook the contribution of other national groups, of the common home that Yugoslavia provided. They overlook the fact that there was tremendously high degree of intermarriage between Serbs and others. Um, and instead, the mantra is, well, any Serb American will tell you, uh, the national motto uh, is only unity saves the Serbs and putting a premium on the retention of a common Serbian identity and a common Serbian homeland. It's okay to have other groups living with you so long as they don't threaten Serbian domination. And I, I might add that Serbs saw Yugoslavia much like Germans saw the Habsburg Empire and great Russians saw the Soviet Union as a state that they had created and they were the unspoken leader of that nation even though they accepted the idea of a multi-ethnic state that they could dominate. You've seen in the textbooks a limited, and certainly in public discourse, a limited rehabilitation of the fascist Chetniks uh, during World War II. Um, and uh, to the point where you have ministers going on radio and television and talking about the good things about the Chetniks, even though their leaders were executed by Tito right after he took over, uh, after show trials had, had taken place. Um, the uh, Croats uh, are seen as, um, excuse me, the Croats have rehabilitated their fascist leader, uh, Ante Pavlic's um, uh, uh, Ustasha, uh, to the extent that they get credit for creating an independent Croatian state for the first time since the Middle Ages. And they, tr they trumpet their distinctly Western Catholic identity because that brings them into the West. And that's where the Croat national identity has to reside. They have to be Western. Uh, a lot of people say they really want to be German, but at least they want to be Western. They can, they can get that. Um, while minimizing the contribution of the Habsburg Empire in putting them in the West. In other words, minimizing multi-ethnic past, but maximizing uh, those features that they want to be part of their national narrative. Romania, um, it's quite widespread since 1989, 1990, the rehabilitation of Antonescu, the fascist dictator who committed uh, numerous crimes, especially against Jews, after coming to power uh, during the, the 1930s. Um, in Slovakia, the rehabilitation of uh, Tiso and Hlinka, the two fascist leaders, one was a Catholic priest uh, who forged an independent Slovakia in the ashes of Czechoslovakia. Now, the Czech Republic doesn't have too many crimes to, uh, um, to uh, 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 be contrite about, um, but uh, the Czechoslovaks have managed to somehow write out of their history uh, the contributions of the Germans, a second time they've done that, uh, but also somehow not put in the history more than one or two sentences in reference to the three and a half million Germans who would have lived, lived in Czechoslovakia in 19, until 1945, three million of whom were expelled brutally in violation, I think we would agree, certainly Václav Havel would, of their human rights. Um, of course, the, the Czechs, uh, the, the Germans were not indigenous to the Bohemian crown lands. They had come in in the Middle Ages as, as miners and as immigrants and frontiersmen. Uh, and, and the same goes uh, in, in Greece, uh, where you have the Bulgarians and Turks who had moved into this, this Byzantine sphere uh, who have been occluded from Greek history. Greeks, in their history books, will not talk about the fact uh, that northern Greece was mainly inhabited by Slavic-speaking uh, Bulgarians or by Spanish-speaking Jews or by Turks. In fact, Salonika is a city that as late as 1941 out of 100 143,000 people, and yeah, out of 100, no, 162,000 people, 90,000 were Spanish-speaking Jews. Not that they didn't also know Greek and Turkish and, and Macedonian and Bulgarian. Uh, but this part of their history, there are no monuments in Salonika to these groups, at least there weren't the last time I looked. Um, this is all part of this elimination, this, this occlusion of inconvenient facts while putting myths in their place. Now, while school books minimize the record of coexistence 
and collaboration between national and ethnic groups, um, they often stress conflicts between them. And so if I can go back to the post-1989 textbooks, um, certainly uh, throughout the former Yugoslavia and in, in much of the rest of the region also, there is a, a discourse of conquest, occupation, and oppression, certainly in the Ottomans here, in the Balkans. Uh, and the Serbs in particular, that their history is seen as a history of national suffering. Not that the Poles don't, okay, uh, not that the Poles don't have uh, a similar um, uh, narrative of persecution in, in their discourse. Uh, the Serbs uh, put a great premium on recounting the mass slaughter of Serbian civilians in World War II. Um, uh, at the age of eight, Serbian school children are taught about genocide against Serbs. Um, there is a textbook, a popular textbook that is given out uh, that talks about Jasenovac, the death camp in which we now know about 50,000 Serbs were murdered, but in the Serbian narrative, it's a million Serbs murdered in Yugoslavia, 350 to 400,000 of them at least in Jasenovac, even though we know that's about 10 times the actual number, not that that isn't horrific. There's an historical atlas in Serbia that shows all the genocidal uh, incidences of cr genocidal crimes committed by the Croats against them, uh, as well as by Hungarians, Germans, Albanians, and Bulgarians. They basically get them all in the mix. But nowhere in the textbooks do they talk about the Chetniks and what they did to Albanians and Muslims and others in World War II. Um, uh, finally, um, I should say the Serbs are in good company here. I certainly don't want this to sound like I'm just focusing on them. Polish school books talk about the horrors of the Nazi occupation uh, including, uh, uh, of course, the Holocaust against the Jews, but they don't really talk that much about, let's say, what the Polish Home Army was doing while it was fighting the Nazis and also murdering Jews, and about the uh, episodes of uh, Polish on Jewish violence committed quite independently of the Nazis. In post-communist Romania and Slovakia, even as they've rehabilitated the, Ax uh, the Axis regimes of Antonescu and Tiso, uh, their school books remain silent about, uh, about the Slovak and Romanian complicity in the commission of genocide against Ukrainian Jews in the 1940s. And um, the Czechs, once again, you know, they, they don't really talk about the uh, massive blanket um, uh, genocide committed, well, I shouldn't call it genocide, well, some people would, uh, the expulsion of the Germans, of the Volksdeutsche, uh, and the collective guilt with which they were saddled. Um, I'll skip over this and maybe you want to. Uh, okay, well, I did want to. I, I do want to mention um, one of the things that I'll give you. Give me two more minutes. Uh, one of the myths that gets into these histories is who was here first. Uh, we know the Germans were not the first in Czechoslovakia. They were relatively late additions. Uh, the Hungarians and Romania probably came in later as well. But of course, the Romanians and also the Albanians in their textbooks. Uh, trumpet the fact that they were there in Roman times, which we can't really prove, but that's what every Albanian, every Romanian will tell you if they get to the schooling system. Uh, in the Serbs, there's one, in Serbia, there's one school book that dates the Serbans back to the Etruscans. Um, and there's even one discourse that hasn't made it into the school books yet that the Serbs come from Atlantis uh, and have made their way. So, you know, the, the, the heritage. And, and recently, in the last year and a half, there is now a very popular myth being created among, among the Bosnians, who had very little identity before this century, as a, as certainly as a state, that these, these pyramid-shaped mounds that have been found in central Bosnia uh, show that the Egyptians got their pyramids from the Bosniaks, yes. which is really interesting. Um, uh, now, in summary, let me say that what we're looking at here is creating national narratives that divide people who live the common history. Uh, there have been attempts made by the international community to somehow influence this discourse. Uh, various international media like Deutsche Welle, BBC, Voice of America, Radio for Europe, NGOs like Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, Soros Foundation, a very big uh, player in this, the Bertelsmann Foundation, among others. Um, there are even, like in the State Department, are programs to try to get these textbooks changed. But if I can go back again to the Frankenstein effect, um, we cannot change this unless politicians agree to change the textbooks. Politicians will not change the textbooks so long as they are democratically elected and are sensitive to the problems that we've already heard the, the Japanese elected officials are, are subject to. We still need to respond to the challenge that democracy has yet to answer 
which is how do you get politicians to exercise the courage to do what they know, because they are more highly educated, present presidency in this country accepted. Um, uh, I have to say, uh, in a, in a uh, uh, meeting I had with the president of Republic of Serbia, we were talking about this, and I, I had to tell him that our country is unique because in our country, actually, the president believes the myths. Um, but uh, <laughs> even when they don't believe the myths, they are captive to it. What they will tell you in private, they can't say publicly because of school books and other mass media. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it, there is, uh, I know that several of you, uh, John in particular, has been, uh, wants to ask questions and so on, so I will try and what I'll do is probably just read my comments in the interest of time and hopefully get it done in 10, 15 minutes. Um, these papers belong to the uh, politics category of the conference and each I think is a fine instance of the implication of history textbooks in uh, political struggles. What I'll try to do is try and grasp the common political struggles underlying each and also provide some materials from the Chinese case, from the Chinese case, which I think uh, furnishes an interesting test to whether or not they belong to the same common uh, political problematic. Uh, just, uh, I must say that uh, thinking of how much a child learns uh, and how long, Charles, as you were saying, they remember it is... Um, is interesting. I don't think there's a general rule, but there are different schools I've taught in, and whereas here, uh, I must say that I think they do change their opinion over time. There are schools where you know you teach them whatever you want. In the end, you'll get the same answer that they have <laughs> been producing, you know, that they have learned. You know, from I don't know where they learned it, for textbooks or what. But no matter how much you teach, right? So there is always that phenomenon, and so maybe textbooks are uh, important here. Uh, Charles Ingram's paper, which will also be discussed by Professor uh, Simone Lesik, uh, presents us with the classic um, form of this uh, political problematic. He shows us how societies require the weapons of mass instruction to adapt to changes and new circumstances, uh, but tend to become rigid, restrictive, what he calls Frankenstein's monsters. Right? He further argues that, ironically, this Frankenstein syndrome is greater in democratizing societies than in authoritarian ones, uh, because in the latter, the dictator is less subject to the monsters of the past than those who have to be re-elected. In another context, I have called this monster the regime of authenticity. It is those symbols, whether heroic figures, self-sacrificing women, uh, events or periods um, like the Golden Age or Dark Ages or indigenous peoples or eternal enemies. Um, it is those symbols that transfer national belonging to the realm of the sacred and enforce the discipline and loyalty required by the nation. As Tom Bender has said, fundamentalism characterizes both the churchmen and the patriots. Thus, while I'm fully in agreement with Charles about Frankenstein's monster, I'm not so sanguine by his implication that it has been overcome in the Western or advanced capitalist democracies. I know you, you sort of, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a subtle argument, but I think there is an implication there. This is a problem that is fundamental to nationalism. And if democracy is one of the culprits, and I don't think it is the main one, in sustaining the regime of national authenticity, then we have to understand Western democracies in a historical context. Racism and exclusion have historically been among the salient features of Western democracies. And while post-war state building and multiculturalism in the context of growing prosperity certainly made these societies more tolerant, as several papers on US and Japan have pointed out, the regime of authenticity has certainly not disappeared. Indeed, I fear that the declining global competitiveness of advanced capitalist society has brought back a distinctly less tolerant nationalism in the US and Japan, and we can see the effects of it precisely in the textbooks. The Nozaki Selden paper on Japan is instructive from several points of view. In the first place, it, it as does Nilaji's paper, shows us that, in fact, politicians do try to change textbooks. Um, 
It is true that the most publicly active groups seeking change are in fact conservative ones. And what do I mean by conservative here? Because I think the meaning of conservative has changed uh, suddenly, not just left to right anymore. Here it means seeking to narrow and restrict the definition and political value of national belonging, I think. Uh, yet we also know how in the Indira Gandhi era in India and in the occupation and for a long time after that in Japan, leftists did get to define the meaning of history and the nation. So my first question is, under what circumstances do the conservatives assert their authority? Do all national histories uh, necessarily entail a quest for authenticity? The monsters, right? Are leftist or more cosmopolitan histories intrinsically disadvantaged in a world system of nation states? What are their monsters and why don't they bite? Uh, that is, why is it hard for people to identify with these leftist narratives, especially if history is the means of producing identification? So, right, you, you start out with these cosmopolitan narratives, and they're supposed to produce that identity, but somehow they revert to a more narrow version, if that is the case. It is worth asking why or if Soviet historical pedagogy did produce an identification with transnational class. What happened to E.P. Thompson's project? Right? I think it's something we should keep coming back to, the making of the English working classes. The Nozaki Selden paper also brings up the issue of the arena or scale of textbook politics. They focus less on the pedagogy than on the politics in the region and the world. This is very suggestive. Increasingly, textbooks are shaped in a regional and, gold, uh, and global context. I'm reminded also of the, California, of the situation in California where um, the, the Hindu right has challenged and in turn has been challenged uh, in their version of the state's uh, world history text, uh, textbooks. What the Nozaki Selden paper shows us, in fact, is that the nationalization of textbooks in Japan has been constrained more and more by regional East Asian and most recently by U.S. opposition. Right? I mean, there was this case of, what's his name, Michael Honda, is that, is that, uh, who has uh, sent, um, uh, who's, uh, I guess, uh, what, he's a member, of, he's uh, a congressman, right? Congressman yeah. from California. California, mm -hmm. yeah, who has opposed uh, this. For me, um, this is an interesting but sad irony. I read it to demonstrate that, by and large, nationalism may be opposed not by democratic counter-trends at home, but by other nationalisms in the region. Uh, I will talk more about this when I speak about Chinese uh, history texts. I'm sure there is a more positive spin on the system of textbook deterrence, and I would like to hear more. The Nozaki Selden paper also suggests variation among textbooks that we see in the US as well. In the US, textbooks are vetted by state authorities, and the relationship with the publisher is an interesting one. Um, I was on the review board of the National Standards of Education uh, of, in History in 1995. Tom Bender is going to discuss it in detail. But I remember well how we actually came to solve the problem that the controversies had, uh, uh, had, uh, had aroused. Uh, this, uh, uh, most of the problems that Lynn Cheney and others uh, were exercised about had to do with uh, what they call the what what the 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 standards called bullets bullet points which refer to uh, principles or trends you know broad historical trends and principles discussed in the text thus the critics oppose the number of references to, to slavery in comparison say to george washington or abraham lincoln and that was that really infuriated them uh, and this was, uh, this was, however, these were not in the bullets, but in the exemplars, in the examples that were given, right? So uh, ultimately, we came up then with a very simple solution to the problem, which is just get rid of the exemplars, right? Keep the bullets out there. And the thinking behind it is interesting, and I know we have people from the publishing houses here, is that um, it was believed that the presses would seek out most of the exemplars in the original version 
anyway, since this was an excellent product, right, of the Center for, the UCLA Center for uh, Historical Education, I mean, I couldn't imagine a better uh, high school textbook than what they produced, actually, and then they had to take it all out. <laughs> um, I don't know if this whole strategy with what the publishers would do has worked or not, but a positive aspect of democracy is that in Japan, as in the US, there's a measure of choice. And that in itself is a dehomogenizing trend counter to uh, nationalism. Indeed, keeping one eye on the market and politics may not always be bad. This may also be worth uh, uh, discussing, I think, later. Niladi's paper also makes a very ca interesting case about the Indian state or provincial variation and transculturation of textbooks. This, of course, need not be progressive in our terms. I mean, you know, uh, in left-right terms, this uh, they could be very conservative uh, transculturation as well. Uh, but the opportunity for localization, I think, uh, as this paper shows later, can also be very uh, important. Finally, I come to the case of China without presenting another paper on it. I just want to say that there are three aspects that I want to talk about. As uh, Charles Ingrao has predicted, it has been relatively easy to change textbooks in China because it is a centralized and non-democratic system. Thus, official histories have adapted to the change from a revolutionary narrative to a statist one quite easily, uh, 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 quite easily adapting to the transition from socialism to capitalism. I mean, this is what China has gone through. And in fact, you can, if you look at the historical changes, they have made the changes too. So, whereas in the 19, till the 1980s, you had Hu Sheng's great three revolutionary climaxes, which were the center of narrative, the Taiping Rebellion, the Boxer Rebellion, and the 1911 revolution. Now, uh, it changed uh, in the 80s and in the 90s to uh, the self-strengthening movement reform, the 100 days reform, also reform, and 1911, but seen much more as bourgeois reform, right? And the, finally, the last version that uh, you see in this, uh, particularly in a movie, not yet in a textbook, is where, you know, people who had begun in the first historical records, I guess, as, as evil people, like the Empress Dowager Zishi with her long nails always appearing, and, you know, the one who was responsible for everything bad, is now depicted as the most loving, caring person. And Yuan Shikai, who was the dictator who completely transformed the meaning of the 1911 revolution, is shown as one of the great statesmen and national leaders. It was very much a status narrative. People who are on top have the interests of the nation uh, in mind and proceed uh, that way. Um, this is, uh, so, so these people have been restored now, and that's one aspect. The second is a relatively greater openness has been made for some criticism of textbooks. Basically here what I want to say is that the state is to some extent withdrawing from a lot of uh, intervention other than at this highest level of history. Uh, this is a celebrated case of Yuan Wei in the CCP Youth magazine called Bing Dian or Freezing Point. Yuan criticized the textbook treatment of imperialism in 1860 and 1900, and he alleged that it was raising this kind of anti, you know, uh, violently anti-imperialist kind of uh, uh, distortion of history was uh, raising another generation of intolerant cultural revolution children. And he also said that, you know, there was no real difference in the way the Japanese and the Chinese uh, uh, dealt with, uh, with the historical narratives. He was, of course, attacked. Interestingly, not so much by the state, but by the historical profession and the population. And Bing Dian was closed down for a bit. It restarted under different leadership. <laughs> Finally, there's the third aspect is there's Shanghai history textbooks. Shanghai, uh, for the first time, I didn't know it was possible, but the Shanghai City Authority obviously had the uh, ability to produce a textbook that was... Uh, uh, for uh, their history students in the metropolitan area. And here, and this was uh, uh, my research assistant Jake did a lot of the website of the online uh, uh, responses to these history textbooks because those of you who read in New York Times know that these history textbooks, high school history textbooks, make no reference to Mao Zedong. They make uh, no reference to the Nanjing massacre. There is, there's nothing. This is very much preparing Shanghai youth for a cosmopolitan global 
uh, integration, right? It's, uh, it's forget about all this past nonsense history kind of thing. And, um, and of course, there was huge criticism of this. And they said, you know, now uh, Shanghai, Shanghai has always been a lair of foreign lackeys. And now, of course, you'll find uh, Ch uh, Chinese women from Shanghai sporting uh, Japanese names. <laughs> and, you know, that's the worst kind of thing, uh, perhaps even marrying Japanese men. Uh, yet uh, again, the Shanghai texts have not been criticized by the state as by the public. And precisely because it does not offend the state greatly, the Shanghai textbook seems to have survived. What does this tell us? Certainly that even if revolution had passed, nationalist monsters continue to reign. Indeed, the monsters created by the state had been taken over by the populace, and even the state fears it now. Second, even though it has been made possible by the state looking askance, we are probably looking in China at a lot of local variation. The resurgence of locality uh, is of course very understandable in terms of the trends towards globalization. It is also an opportunity for professional historians to reconnect or connect to popular conceptions of the value of history. Niladri and his textbook project, I believe, have made some very astute moves in this direction. To be sure, the local cannot be divorced from the national and transnational, and we are mindful that both scales can be traps. The NCERT group emphasizes a critical and constructionist approach to historical pedagogy. The attention to everyday life and the local can also be a way to foster this approach that is meaningful to the public. Whether or not people in this system or in any can manage without truths and beliefs that they take for granted is the big question. I fervently hope that, the Nil that Niladri and his group will succeed. <laughs> okay. Thank you.